everybody. Welcome to the January um, 2020 call. If you are new to this call, my name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff and I'll be hosting today's call. Um, I think that uh, most of you are probably aware that our founder, Marshall Saunders, passed away on December the 27th. And we will be having a tribute for Marshall at the end of this call. But in the many, many discussions Marshall and I had about values and what particularly he said was important, what he said was important is constancy. And I think the best way for us to honor him is to uh, do our work today, excuse me. Um, and so what I'll be doing is I'll be introducing our speaker in just a couple of minutes. We'll go over some of the things that happened since last month's call <clears throat> and some of the things we're doing this month. Sorry, I got something caught in my throat, bad timing. But I do want you to know that uh, over the last couple of months, as it was obvious what was happening in Marshall's life, he was at peace with what was happening. Uh, he was never in any pain. The process was very dignified. He faced this courageously. He was never scared. He was simply dignified and surrounded by an incredibly loving family. And although I miss him very, very much, um, the process happened in the way that you would expect that Marshall would face something with the kind of class and dignity that he'd done everything in his life. And we'll, we'll do more of this um, towards the end of today's call. Uh, we're very excited to have John Witt on from Better Angels. It's so important that we have organizations that are working on similar tracks that we are in trying to get people to work together. There's a workshop that uh, his organization is leading that uh, is described as this. Much of today's epidemic of toxic polarization between climate advocates and climate skeptics is driven by how we talk with like-minded people about those on the other side. Too often we stereotype, dismiss, or ridicule our fellow citizens who differ from us in their perspective on climate change. Although polarization in some form has always been around, nowadays people on the other side have become not just strangers, but enemies. And so we're very happy to have John and his work with Better Angels. And in addition to his work with Better, Better Angels, he was, is a former nominee of Congress, He's the former vice chairman of the Republican Party of Los Angeles Co County and the author of the upcoming book, Transcending Politics, Perspectives for Divided Nations. We're hoping that there's time after John's opening comments that we can take some questions in the chat that Ricky will monitor. But John, welcome. It is great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us on a Saturday morning. Yeah, well, absolutely, Mark. It's a pleasure to be able to speak uh, to all of you. And uh, my condolences, of course, uh, for the passing of of Mr. Mr. Saunders, um, but clearly he leaves behind a remarkable legacy and the very fact that there's such tremendous enthusiasm and commitment from such a wide range uh, of Americans as is represented on this call is, uh, is a testimony to that, to that very fact. Uh, so Mark, I have uh, what, 10, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, is that correct? Okay. All right, that's right, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, those, those who know me know I'm, I'm usually just getting warmed up after about 10 to 15 minutes, but I will, uh, <laughs> I will be as concise as I can manage to be uh, in, in the time frame. First of all, um, it's wonderful for me to note um, that th there's a tremendous, as you alluded to, Mark, there's a tremendous affinity, I think, between the culture at work uh, in Citizens Climate Lobby and Better Angels. In fact, we share, uh, I think we share, uh, we share members. Uh, we have leaders who house uh, some of your uh, some of your members and some of your um, uh, leaders uh, in the run-ups to your your conventions. Uh, we have uh, joint uh, projects that I think we're beginning looking to depolarize attitudes around the issue of climate change specifically, and uh, all of that is uh, something that's well worth highlighting because I think it speaks to a shift in uh, or to sort of a budding kind of what I like to think of as a civic renaissance in America, a new sort of social kind of trajectory wherein people are not just looking at nearly at, at, at the sort of craft of citizenship as being limited merely to, to voting and, and, you know, shouting at your radio or, or, or at your favorite or least favorite uh, cable news pundit when they say something you, you do or don't like, um, but that rather the culture of citizenship is something that embraces diversity and collaboration obviously across boundaries of experience, partisan perspective, et cetera. 
And so what you guys are doing and what we're seeking to do at Better Angels, uh, it's very much emblematic of, emblematic of that culture. So I'd like to say a little bit more about that, but first let me talk a little bit about Better Angels, uh, what we've accomplished in our short story. And it has been a relatively uh, short story to date. So right now, Better Angels is the, the sort of elevator um, summation of who we are is we are the nation's largest grassroots bipartisan organization uh, working specifically on the, uh, on the issue of uh, political depolarization. And within that, I would say, uh, cultivating a greater sense of shared American identity and shared community across the party divide, and within that, of course, across all of the other divides that fold in uh, to, the, to the bitter partisan polarization that is, you know, toxicifying so much of, so much of American politics. Uh, you might, uh, you can trace the birth of Better Angels back to uh, our initial workshop in 2016 in the immediate aftermath of the presidential election. Uh, Better Angels co-founders uh, David Blankenhorn, uh, family therapist uh, Bill, and professor of, uh, at the University of Minnesota, Bill Doherty, and my colleague David Lapp brought together, uh, I think about 10 or 11 uh, Hillary Clinton voters and Donald Trump voters in the town of South Lebanon, Ohio, immediately following the workshop for a two or three, immediately following the election, for a two or three day retreat where they challenged themselves to see if through structured processes, um, to see if these groups of Americans wouldn't be able to rediscover uh, common ground and a sympathetic understanding of who the other person was beyond the political label in the aftermath of what we all remember was the most heated and ugly presidential election, I think, in, in maybe any of our lifetimes. And uh, the success of this workshop, in spite of the emotions that went into it, was so phenomenal that it caused the, uh, it, it caused the original leaders of the organization to believe that this was something that could spread across the country. And so uh, David and my uh, partner and colleague, Karen O'Connor and uh, uh, April Lawson and a few others uh, got on a bus, traveled up and down the, uh, uh, up and down the East Coast and the South uh, on a shoestring budget, held workshops in local communities until it sort of caught on like fire, local media picked it up. And suddenly we had people uh, sort of uh, beating paths to our doors, looking to take advantage of this red and blue workshop program that seemed to be so effective in bringing Americans together in genuine, in genuine empathy. And so that became the initial offering uh, of Better Angels programmatically. And so Better Angels as an organization really didn't start to mature uh, until, until about spring or summer of 2017 after the, uh, as the bus tour uh, was underway. Today, uh, we are a national membership organization. We have just under about 9,000 dues paying members. We have 50 Better Angels Alliances. You can think of them as bipartisan chapters, uh, but 50 alliances across the country. We've held about 700, and, well, just under 800 or so uh, workshops across the country, including the Red Blue Workshop, uh, which I've described, where we bring small groups of reds and blues together, not to argue or debate, but to speak from the vantage point of personal experience in terms of why they see politics the way they do, basically marriage counseling for political for political conversations. Uh, but also we have programs, including debate programs that are hosted on, better, on, a, on a university and college campuses and in local communities, meant to give people the opportunity not just to clobber each other with facts or statistics, but actually to be open and honest uh, in an intellectual, an intellectually humble way about why they see things the way they do and where they might be wrong about a given issue. We, in our debate program, give people the opportunity to explore their own doubts and even to change their mind midstream during the course of an exchange if they feel that the other side has moved them. And so the point isn't there about victory, it's about the collective pursuit of truth that really ought to animate the passion of citizenship, I think, in the context of our democratic society. So we have programs like that. We have programs like our Depolarizing Within workshop, which is aimed at helping us to discipline ourselves, not to think the worst about the other side, not to think uncharitably, and to become aware when we are thinking in ways that cause us to see uh, our fellow citizens in too narrow a lens. And so we have all of these programs. We have this community that we're building out nationwide of Americans who are forging bonds and looking to go deeper in terms of our mutual understanding 
of our American heritage, of the values that bind us. And I think for two major reasons. On the one hand, on a deeply personal level, uh, many Americans, and I'm sure I, I probably speak for uh, you know a fair number of people, maybe on this call as well, um, have seen their own families, their own friendships, uh, personal relationships uh, at work, at ministry, wherever the case may be, suffer on, on account of the fact that because we've taken in so much of the sort of poisonous assumptions that are filtered through to us uh, through, through the partisan media, et cetera, um, this, this sort of tainted way of our looking at each other, thinking the worst of each other, I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat, therefore I think you want government to take away all my rights and freedoms, you're a Democrat, yeah, I'm a Republican, therefore you think I'm anti-immigrant or anti-poor anti, anti -poor person, et cetera. We allow these frames to infect even the relationships that we have with the people we care and love most in the world. And so people come to us for a way to, uh, to, to remedy the personal uh, divisions and, and wounds that they've suffered as a, as a part of this. But the other part of it is just the fact that we know, uh, our members know, and the American people know, I think, that uh, ultimately, regardless of which political party may occupy, uh, may, may uh, lead the houses of Congress or occupy the White House, our democratic society is not sustainable unless there is a genuine culture of goodwill that exists between the parties, that exists between the American people across all lines of political categorization. Um, because at the end of the day, the incentives that animate the politicians and the parties are going to track the attitudes that we have towards one another. If political success can be earned by destroying goodwill between the American people, politicians will, will seek to act in that way. But we all know that that makes consensus over difficult issues um, impossible to achieve. And that's precisely why the work of Citizens Climate Lobby is so tremendous. Um, because it, it brings Americans together uh, on an issue that, one, couldn't be any more important to the practical uh, survival of the nation, I mean, you know, of, of, of humanity, broadly speaking, you can, easily, you can easily argue, and yet it seeks to do so in a way that doesn't just lean upon, you know, punditry at CNN or, or high-placed politicians to, to do all the legwork and to try and, you know, try and move society from, from the top down, but rather it does the work of forging genuine citizen to citizen relationships on the basis of shared values um, in a way that makes our commitment to the issue more than just a commitment to the, to, the, to the policy issue that you guys are supporting in and of itself, but more deeply speaking, a commitment to the humanity and the decency um, and, um, and, and, and the genuine personal value of one another. And that has to be the basis from which we seek to accomplish any significant uh, political consensus and reform in this country, because it is the foundation upon which a healthy democratic society, a healthy republic endures. And so uh, establishing a, a structured sort of uh, institutional culture and in civil society for the flowering of that type of a civic spirit, that type of a culture of citizenship, that is the work of better angels. Uh, and so uh, my, my great and, uh, and enduring hope uh, is that our organizations and our communities uh, can increasingly find and build on the synergy that already exists. Like I said, we've taken a lot of inspiration from, from you folks already. Um, I get the feeling that that feeling maybe may well be mutual. And I think that uh, zooming out a little bit, I think that the, the, the long-term and even the short-term, <laughs> honestly, prospects of our national health and just sort of the, the ability of our, of our civil society and our political society to endure hinges upon the ability of organizations and communities like ours uh, to be able to sort of in interlink our efforts in the mutual support of a culture of citizenship that can reanimate the way we look at politics and uh, social culture in America, um, and, well, in a way that, that serves as the antidote for the polarization that right now is making broader progress uh, close to impossible uh, on the national level. 
And so I don't know where I'm at with respect to time, Mark, but that's, uh, I think that about captures my basic uh, sentiments here. I'm very grateful once again to all of you for having me here today. And if we've got some time, I'm more than happy uh, to field some questions. Uh, Great. So Ricky will monitor the questions in the chat and then uh, he'll summarize one of the ones where there's consistent themes. One of the first questions I have though is, uh, it's obviously easier to just blame the other for the polarization. It's their fault. You know, I'm, I'm basically a good person, but they're, they're so terrible that uh, they put me in a position where I need to be, you know, uh, extreme to my side also. How do you get past that just initial, uh, let's say kind of call it moral laziness, where it's just easier to reinforce your side's view and, and get people to think, you know, maybe I have something to say about this also. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so there are, a couple of, there are a couple of angles on that question. So first of all, uh, it's always easiest to work, work with the willing, right? So you might imagine that in terms of our committed members and leaders, these are people who see the problem, who recognize the fact that even if I don't like the other side, you know, we've got to find a way to that you need to be able to listen to what the other folks are saying. So you get a person like that into our workshop, they have the opportunity to listen to the other side speak in their own language about what they think, what they feel, suddenly it becomes a lot easier to sort of recognize the humanity that's animating somebody with whom you may share a significant political to the idea that there's some value in interacting with the other side on an empathetic level because they already they already assume assume the worst. I think it's important to sort of appeal to the moral foundations um, uh, that are that are present in successful social movements in our history uh, as a means of demonstrating to people the power of certain virtues and values and bringing out the best uh, in the other side in a way that leads to the social progress that we might all want. Personally, uh, the great example that uh, animates much of my thinking and that I think is echoed in a fair amount of the values and culture of our work is the value of, uh, is the philosophy of nonviolence as was uh, morally sort of articulated by Martin Luther King Jr. This idea that love is a social value is powerful because it accomplishes two things. One, it calls upon us to see the in, to see the king would have said the vowness in the other individual the idea that the other person is made in the image of god but really just the idea that there's basic human goodness in the person on the other side and that even if that person is wrong and is oppressing you you want to you want to signal to that person that you have nothing but goodwill for them for two reasons one because it allows you to speak to that person's conscience in a way that shows them that you are not their enemy, you are seeking to be their friend, and you're looking to engage them on the level of moral truth. So love and empathy in that way is disarming and therefore strategically effective as a premise for communication. But two, uh, having a charitable and empathetic, a, a love as goodwill based attitude towards your political opponent allows you to unshackle yourself from the psychological burdens of bitterness and hatred and contempt that you know we may become addicted to in the way that folks might become addicted to you know fast food or cigarettes or whatever the case may be but that we know is not ultimately you know something that's going to satisfy or lend itself to a healthy internal life right and so the health of the individual or the individual on the inside is is achieving that kind of cleansing of perspective towards the other is very much a part of the value of engaging in this kind of process. It makes you um, so then what kind of tools and recommendations do you give people, you know, after they're in one of their workshops to uh, give them their best chance of succeeding with this over time and maintaining it? Mm, right. So the, the way in which the community and the really sort of the organizational structure at Better Angels has evolved is that 
participation in the sort of red blue workshop that I mentioned to you or one of our other programs is not the end point to your engagement in the work of better angels and more broadly speaking just sort of a renewed kind of understanding of your career of citizenship so to speak uh, it's the starting point so after having uh, participated in one of our workshops and having become sort of acculturated uh, to the to the values and the philosophies that are animating uh, our our citizen to citizen interactions and relationship buildings at Better Angels, you then have the opportunity to go further in that work within Better Angels uh, as a member of your local Better Angels Alliance. And our alliances are empowered uh, to do two things uh, categorically, primarily. On the one hand, uh, they're empowered to serve as a base of support for Better Angels volunteers who are organizing workshops, moderating workshops, or chairing de debates, working with local community groups, campuses, et cetera, in order to, in order to multiply uh, the sort of dialogue and uh, relationship building and, and, and issue discussion formats that we have. But the other thing that our alliances are empowered to do is where there is a, where a minimum uh, level of bipartisan threshold is achieved in the alliance uh, to work together uh, uh, in drafting a policy proposal and supporting an issue of common concern in their local community, or maybe some project, that is, or maybe working on some project that is not directly politically uh, directly political, but that nevertheless is something that unites people within the local within the local alliance structure, uh, and so. Uh, as our organization matures and expands, what we want to see our, our, our sense of, of um, our attitudes towards the other side and our ability to be, communicate with the other side being enriched by these initiatives into further uh, levels of engagement where we can apply directly what we learn in the workshops to the work of building coalitions around issues that matter, uh, both locally uh, and, and beyond. That's the type of ongoing uh, uh, process that we, want to, uh, uh, that we want to develop more and more uh, over the course of time. And we're to a pretty good start with respect to already. Great, Ricky. What are you uh, What are you seeing in the chat that you would like um, Mr. Wood to address? Yeah, I think uh, there's some questions around this. The theme of um, what you were mentioning earlier about politics being, you know, uh, polarizing solutions really not necessarily polarizing. But uh, you know, for an issue like ours, where, you know, you're, you're speaking more generally about you know bipartisanship across the mm -hmm. spectrum. But an issue like ours that's really kind of stuck in a political context. You know, starting with empathy is good, but would you have any other thoughts about what's next after that, you know, to, to sort of lift it up out of that political context? Yeah, right, indeed. Well, so with, with, respect, to, with respect to the issue of climate change, of course, it, it's, it's one of the most polarizing issues we have on the table in part because, well, like with so many, so many other issues, there are partisan storylines that are sort of built into the different sides of how we interact with this issue that cause us to buy into a bunch of assumptions about the other side that may not be fair, but that are very difficult to deprogram in the course of arguing, you know, just having a one-to-one -one conversation about a subject like climate change. And so you might be talking to somebody and think, okay, we're, we're debating climate science and whether or not this is or is not a problem, and if so, how significant a problem. But really, there's these other sort of subconscious frames we're working with, where somebody on one side of the issue might look at the other and say, well, you know, you're conservative, therefore you're anti-science to begin with. You might be some religious nut job. You know, how am I going to take you seriously? And, you know, the guy on the right might look at the, you know, and obviously we have bipartisan support on both sides of this issue, as is evidenced by your organization. But, but, you know, stereotypically, person on the right might look at the person on the left and say, this person's bought into a globalist agenda. This person is, you know, some environmental, environmental nut job. Uh, you know, this is somebody who wants to use uh, climate science as a, as a uh, blunt instrument to beat back uh, traditional values and culture, uh, expand the government's power, et cetera. And so I think that beyond empathy, um, what we are seeking to cultivate I, I talked a little bit about a shared sort of culture of, of citizenship and American identity. I do think 
that part of what we want to do, and by the way, an aspect of our work at Better Angels is directly media related in terms of original content creation. So uh, me and my colleague Kieran O'Connor were co hosts of the Better Angels podcast. We have regular writers and, and uh, essayists uh, on our website, uh, are increasingly uh, putting together original video contents, et cetera. There needs to be um, a more unifying storyline about what it is to be an American that cuts through uh, these, these, these poison sorts of left-right versions of what an American is that highlights uh, and honors uh, the, the moral foundations that we find in liberal, in politically uh, progressive tradition and, and politically and socially conservative traditions, but that interweaves them into a common story. Um, if you don't have that, if we don't have a way of talking about what it is to be an American that isn't colored, so to speak, red or blue, uh, then it means that we're always going to be, even if we're all speaking English technically, we're always going to be speaking different languages in terms of how we interact uh, on, the, on the basis of specific issues. And so, you know, a big part of my, my focus, and I think increasingly our organizational uh, focus at Better Angels, is trying to imagine ways by which in forging, in forging and deepening our community within Better Angels, uh, we can use these various vehicles, including media content, et cetera, to begin to tell a new story about what it means to be an American. But that story itself has to be the result of an authentic dialectic uh, process within our organization and beyond our organization. And that's why the sorts of convenings that we hold locally and nationally, and by the way, we have a national convention, which I hope to see many of you at. Um, we've, we've held it uh, for the last two years since the organization got going in earnest, and we'll have our third, and I think by far our largest convention this uh, May, at the end of May, uh, at the uh, University of uh, North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, not long before the GOP convention uh, in the city. Um, we seek to use all of these vehicles as a means of establishing a unifying story or narrative uh, as to what it means to actually be an American that can speak to who we really are authentically in a non-generic way, way left and right. And if we can accomplish that, we can begin to have these polarizing policy debates in actual good faith. Wow, that's fantastic, John. And uh, I'm really looking forward to our collaboration on all kinds of levels on the, all of this. I uh, just so grateful for your work. Um, so grateful that you could be on the call with us today. And I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you a lot more. And uh, you are certainly welcome to stay on for the next few minutes if you like. But we, we also understand that it is a Saturday morning where you are. But thank you so much, John. That was fantastic. Not a problem. I'll, I'll write it out to the end here with you guys. And once again, very honored and appreciative and look forward to the work we can do together uh, in the future. Great. Thank you. Okay, good. So um, I want to just go over a couple of things that happened since um, last month's call. Um, so both the city of San Francisco and the county of Sa San Francisco endorsed the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So for the, all of you who are involved with that, uh, that is great work. Congratulations. It's nice to see both the city and county. We ended this year with 181,421 supporters, which is almost a 70,000 increase in supporters over the course of this year. So for everybody who tabled, everybody who gave a talk, everybody who did any kind of outreach event, anybody who invited somebody to the inter introductory call, your work really paid off big time. Uh, we ended the year with 466 U.S. chapters and over 100 chapters outside of the U.S. So 466 U.S. and additional over 100 outside of the U.S. We had 1,708 meetings with congressional offices. You know, we had uh, last year 1,656, and I just didn't think you know, given there's just not that many chances that that total would ever be surpassed, but 1,708 meetings with congressional offices this year. Also 4,715 published media pieces just in traditional media. So that was just traditional media that doesn't count any of the stuff happening in social media. And then at the end of the year, uh, most of you probably know we had a goal of raising $500,000 between Giving Tuesday and December 31st, and what you actually donated was 
$523. So for so many of you on this call who donate so much of your time already to also make a financial contribution, that was really huge. And that includes 160 people who hosted individual Facebook fundraisers this year. So thank you so much, not just for everything you did over the year with your time, but also making the year-end appeal so, um, so successful. So uh, in Canada, we're going to be doing planning on 2020 and also sending our MPs a save the date for May 11th, which is the reception after our conference in Ottawa this year in, in Canada. In the U.S., we're already starting to work on the in-district lobby drive. So start planning your meetings for the in-district uh, for the first part of the year. Um, then uh, get to work on your 2020 plan, how you're going to use the five levers. And then also include in this uh, section are recommendations of things you could do to remember Marshall. I think one of the things that I love about this organization is how personal it is and how much Mar Marshall's a part of our culture. Uh, and so if there's something that you want to do to, um, to remember Marshall, there's recommendations also in the action sheet. So uh, what's going to happen now is uh, Susan Higgins pro uh, provided us a little tour so she can sh actually show you where Marshall worked for the last couple of decades. So Ricky, if you could share that and Susan, if you could walk us through this. Thank you, Mark. And I apologize if there's a delay in the audio. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be taking you on this tour of Marshall's office today. What you see here is the intersection of Orange and Adela Avenues in Coronado. That black arrow is pointing to our building. As you can see, it's a beautiful spot. Next slide. Our offices are on the third floor of that little building. The this tiny hallway leads to suite 309, which is Marshall's office, and it's a favorite stop when visitors drop by. And Marshall always gave a hearty welcome. Next slide. Here we just stepped into the doorway. That's Marshall's desk there to the right. As you can see, the walls are covered with photos, posters, cards, awards, art, and other memorabilia going all the way back to his work with Results and Grameen de la Frontera and Rotary. Next slide. Turn to the left and we see the other corner of the office. This whole room measures about 10 by 12, but that glass door leading to the patio lets you see the sky and connect to the outdoors. When you step out all the way on that patio, you can see the ocean to the west. Next slide. This is Marshall's workstation. He sits to the right and his assistant sits to the left. The assistant's job is to help Marshall go through emails, do research, be a sounding board for ideas, print phone call lists, and sometimes help Marshall order a book or perhaps a gift for Pam. My favorite thing was to be the audience when he rehearsed a speech. He wanted to be sure his jokes were funny. <laughs> Next slide. Rotating again, we're looking back where we came in. You can see Marshall's bookshelf on the left filled with books, pictures, small sculptures, and souvenirs. That chair is where Mark sits when he and Marshall get to talking. At the right, that's the side of the bookshelf. Every inch is filled with pictures and special cards. Next slide. Here's a closer look at the bookshelf. Next slide. The room is full of pictures and it's very fun. Many years of adventures and work and connecting with people are all on display. Next slide. Really special mementos are framed and stand on top of the desk along with some small gifts from people. Next slide. Marshall was devoted to meditation and read a lot of Eknath Iswaran's works. His picture is down near the bottom. Next slide. I wish there was time for more close-ups of some of these beautiful photos. Next slide. We have a lot of curiosity about who all these people and places and times are. Next slide. 
There are pictures, old pictures mixed with new pictures, family over the years, friends over the years. Next slide. There are so many pictures of all of you here. Next slide. Lots of happy times and loved experiences. Marshall's presence is everywhere in this room. Next slide. More awards, collages, children's art, anything artsy. Everything illustrates Marshall's deep connection to people and the world. Next slide. Pictures from conferences over the years, birthdays, weddings. The room has been filled with love and laughter for a long, long time. Next slide. There are multiple certificates of appreciation in several different languages, along with art from some of these countries. Next slide. I can see his warm smile on every wall. Next slide. Here's the back of the door with a treasured Gandhi quote. I'll turn this over to Mark for the last slide. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Yeah, so this is what you would see on the door in Marshall's office when we closed it. He said, whenever you're in doubt, apply the first test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man whom you may have ever seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is gonna be any help to him, any use to him. Will he gain anything from it? Will it restore him to control over his own life and destiny? True development puts first those that society puts last. I love that that was the inside of Marshall's door. Okay, we're gonna invite Sam Daly Harris who founded Results and was the person who, um, who coached Marshall through the process of starting CCL to say a few words. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, when Marshall Saunders would speak at a Citizens Climate Lobby conference, he usually started something like this. Hello! It's so good to see you! Do you know why he was so excited to see you? He was that excited because before he started CCL, he wasn't sure anyone would show up. The tipping point incident went something like this. It was at an old age home. As Marshall said, I was 68 years old and they looked old to me. After one of his many climate talks, using slides from an inconvenient truth, the first questioner described her difficulty reading when using the new energy efficient light bulbs. She asked if she could use two of the new light bulbs instead of one of the old ones. Marshall didn't know what to say. Another elderly lady asked the most basic question, what should we do? What's needed, Marshall said, is thousands of ordinary people organized, lobbying their members of Congress with one voice, one message, and lobbying in a relentless, unstoppable, yet friendly and respectful way. Why don't you do that? she asked. Feeling cornered, Marshall replied, I haven't done that because nobody would come to a meeting like that. That's why Marshall was so excited to see you and he'd start, hello, it's so great to see you. Back at the rest home, the elderly woman said to Marshall, I'll help you. Feeling trapped, Marshall said, okay, let's do it. He started inviting people to the initial meeting, the first CCL meeting, but the inviting wasn't going well. He called the elderly lady three times or four times, but she never answered. Marsha feared an empty room and thought about canceling, but kept inviting anyway. 29 people showed up. Marshall felt that he needed at least four of the 29 to sign up in order to have a group. To my great surprise, he said, all 29 signed up. One of the things that was the most beautiful about Marshall was that he kept looking honestly at the world and asking what's needed. I searched for a source for that honest looking and action in this excerpt from Reclaiming Our Democracy. 
It's hard to put a finger on one event in a person's life that leads to founding an organization like CCL. But when I look for clues, I search for existential moments in which the preciousness of life is so profoundly experienced that it launches a continued quest to live a life that truly matters. So what were those moments in Marshall's life? As you'll see, his life was as ordinary as any at first. I was a guy who wanted to play everything safe, Marshall replied. I wanted a peaceful life with my wife and two kids and wanted to be left alone. But in 1980, Marshall started taking human development courses and made a contract with himself that said, I trust myself as I seek out new risks and commit to new responsibilities. At first I softened it so I didn't have to take risks, he remembered. But then I realized that risks are at the heart of it. Maybe that's the beginning, shifting from a life of safety to a life that incorporates some risk. Marshall joined Rotary, this is the 80s, and started visiting community service projects like the Pan American Institute, a private junior high for the poor in Tijuana, Mexico. At about this time, Marshall began receiving dividends from Big Red, his family's soda company, founded decades earlier by his grandfather in his hometown of Waco, Texas. The experience with the school and the new income led Marshall and his wife, Pam, to eventually provide 15,000 meals a year to the students. But now life had a new lesson to deliver. Right after I joined Ro Rotary, Marshall said, I had a physical and learned that I had prostate cancer. Unfortunately, the sur surgery didn't get it all and it's incurable. At the time I was beginning to get family money off the big red, I had the desire to make a difference and now I learned I'm going to die. It became a race to see how much I can get done before I get too sick to do it and die. But to the great good fortune of Marshall and an untold number of others, he wouldn't die anytime soon, but would instead live a life as if he were. Maybe trusting oneself to seek out new risks and committing to new responsibilities, coupled with the specter of death looking over your shoulder, are part of what fueled the founding of an organization like CCL. Here's one last glimpse of Marshall's brilliance around looking at what's needed, even if it meant moving himself out of the way. He knew that Mark Reynolds was just the right person to be executive director of CCL. So he had breakfast meetings to enroll Mark. As I understand it, during that first breakfast meeting, Mark looked at Marshall and said, wait, wait a minute. You're telling me that you want to combine, combine climate change and working with Congress, the two things in the world that are working the least? Are you crazy? But Marshall kept having his breakfast meetings with Mark once a month for six months until Mark said yes. But he'd only come on for six months and they'd hand CCL back over to Marshall. Those six months would have ended about 10 years ago. Thank God they didn't end. And thank God for being blessed to have Marshall Saunders in our lives. One last note, my op-ed honoring Marshall titled, How One Man Trapped by Two Elderly Ladies in a Rest Home Empowered Citizens on Climate Change was in the most recent CCL Weekly Briefing. If you'd like to read it, to help decide if you'd like to pitch the op-ed to your local paper, send me an email at sam at civiccourage.org and I'll forward it a version that's ready for pitching. Ricky has put the email in the chat, that's sam at civiccourage.org. So thank you so much and I love you. And of course we all love Marshall. Thank, thank you. you so thank you so much, Sam. <clears throat> and for those who haven't seen it, Sam wrote a fantastic piece. So thank you so much, Sam Daly Harris.
Thank you, Susan Flores Higgins, for giving us the tour of, of um, Marshall's office. Thank you, John Wood, for your extraordinary work. A couple things that are going to be happening shortly. In the first week of February, we're going to have our first ever conservative only lobby day. So, this is a first time event. There's over 80 people coming. We're very excited about doing a conservative only event. And also, staying on a conservative thing, theme, Bob Inglis will be our guest speaker for February. So, Thank you all so much for what you're doing. Uh, I'm gonna, Ricky's gonna unmute the lines and he'll send the uh, camera around for a tour so everybody can wave goodbye to everybody else on the call. Thank you all so much. <laughs> You gotta trust you. You're gonna be. We are not going to participate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.